Welcome to EOA on Demand. I'm Dr. Serge Pushlin. I'm one of the trauma and fracture care specialists at the University of Orthopedic Associates. Um, I have today with me uh, Dr. Dave Polinet and Dr. Carlos Sahibian, um, the other trauma and fracture care specialists of, at the University of Orthopedics. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, tibial plateau fractures and uh, the uh, treatment options, uh, outcomes, and uh, additional information that's important to the patients. Uh, first, I'd like to ask uh, Dave uh, to tell us a little bit about what tibial plateau fractures actually are. Thanks. So tibial plateau fractures are fractures that occur around the knee. Uh, the fractured bone is the tibia. And uh, here's a picture of a tibia. This is an a normal intact tibia. Uh, and this is what a tibia looks like on an x-ray in the knee, in the region of the knee. This is an intact tibia that's not broken. And on this next picture, you can see in the case of a fractured tibia in the area of a knee, what these dark lines represent is fracture lines. Fractures that occur in this area are frequently complex fractures. They have multiple fragments of bone and cartilage that are affected. And our concern is that if we don't restore the alignment of the bone and the cartilage that's attached to the bone, then our, the outcome may not be so good. And we want to prevent you uh, from getting arthritis uh, or having an outcome that's not uh, what you want it to be. So these are fractures that occur uh, uh, fairly frequently in our practice. We see a lot of these. Um uh, with the this type of fracture, uh, there are several treatment options. Can you tell us about that, Carlos? So just about with uh, any any fractures that we treat, there's always uh, multiple treatment modalities that uh, we can offer our patients. Uh, first and foremost, uh, you know we're a conservative practice, and we, we can always if we can help you avoid surgery, then we're all for it. And uh, some of these fractures, although very rarely, uh, can go without surgery. Uh, we do offer non-operative care if the fracture is very well lined up and you could barely see the fracture site. Uh, in fact, I just had one last week uh, that was very, very minimally displaced. The joint was overall looked pretty much perfect. I really could not make it any better with surgery. So we offered the patient non-operative treatment and they were very happy to have that, uh, that option. So we generally would put people on a hinged knee brace and let them start working on range of motion of their knee. And then once the fracture heals, they can advance their weight bearing. So that's always the one option is uh, non-operative care. Uh, the second option is, uh, and it's generally generally uh, something that we do quite often with these injuries, as Dr. Polinet mentioned, they're generally complex injuries, they're high energy injuries, and uh, we are obviously treating not just the bone, but we're treating the entire extremity, and uh, frequently the entire leg is so swollen from the accident, from the, the whole trauma uh, that caused the bone to break, also causes the muscles to swell, the skin to swell. And if, uh, if the knee is too swollen, uh, we cannot safely do the surgery because we will be unable to close the wounds, uh, the surgical incisions at the end of the case. Uh, and that can obviously lead to a whole host of uh, issues, including infection and wound issues that we don't want to deal with. So a good temporization is to put someone into an external fixator. And that is uh, basically where we can add some pins that uh, are away from all the swelling in the middle of the femur and uh, pins down near the ankle that we can then connect to a series of rods and clamps that will hold the leg out straight, hold the knee relatively well lined up, uh, and first and foremost, keep tension on the skin, which allows the swelling to subside. So uh, once we go that route, uh, patients will generally be in an external fixator for approximately two weeks. Uh, during that time, we can usually see the swelling uh, decrease significantly. We instruct our patients to ice their knees, elevate their extremities, um, and once, the, once they're safe for surgery, then we can re return to the operating room to definitively fix the tibial plateau fracture the way that we want to. Uh, finally, uh, it, there are times when it's not a very high energy injury, just happen to take a misstep and just the way the forces uh, worked out, it just happened to be a perfect impact. And you, know, you break the tibial plateau, but it was just a simple fall off a step or a you know, second rung of a ladder, that sort of thing where the swelling is not significant. If the swelling is not significant, we would obviously like to get things fixed as soon as possible and not delay treatment in an external fixator. So in those circumstances, uh, we can generally uh, provide the patient with uh, operative fixation uh, when they present to the hospital and, and get them fixed and on their way. So 
The three major treatment modalities are non-operative, uh, external fixation, which is a temporary treatment. And then the final treatment, uh, whether it's external fixation or whether the leg is not too swollen is to, is to fix it definitively. Uh, we generally do this with uh, uh, plates and screws that hold the uh, joint back together. I think it's important to understand and reinforce that. So we talked about sometimes you have two operations to treat this injury, and that doesn't sound too appealing to a patient. Uh, I think it's important to understand why we would do that and why they actually would want that to be their treatment algorithm. It takes the judgment of somebody who's managed a lot of these injuries to understand when, if we proceed with surgery, uh, the leg isn't really ready for having surgery. The, the leg is uh, at risk for developing wound healing complications and risk of infection. And these are some of the worst outcomes you can see with this type of injury is when um, a surgeon uh, tries to do everything he can or she can for, for the injury and the outcome is an infection, which really uh, complicates the, the course and the, the ultimate outcome. So having, having uh, someone with the judgment and the experience to manage the injuries in the most appropriate manner, however complex and rough a course it is, will get you the best outcome in the end, which is important to us. Yeah, I think to echo that point, Dave, we do get patients referred to our practice uh, as we are the fracture specialists uh, here in New Jersey, three of the three of the main fracture specialists here that, you know, outside surgeons, you know, these are very complex injuries and and they know enough to put an external fixator on something, but they they know they don't have the skill set to necessarily fix it. And so it's it's very reasonable to to have the outside surgeon put on the external fixator and then get referred to our office. And uh, patients often ask me, you know, did they do the right thing? You know, should they fix it right away? And you know, my answer is always the same. A absolutely, that uh, if if the other outside surgeon had thought an external fixator was what needed to happen, then that was absolutely the right decision. Uh, much lower risk profile to avoid some of the things Dr. Paul and I was just talking about. I think it's also about, uh, reflecting back on a uh, comment that you made about non-operative management. Uh, it's also important to understand that we don't treat every patient the same for the same type of injury. If you're 20 years old or if you're 80 years old, the, the treatment algorithm can vary because the amount of surgery that's involved in, in some of these injuries would be inappropriate for an 80-year-old to go through. Uh, and uh, and a, a joint replacement, which could be a, a consideration for somebody who's much older uh, and gives them a more simple uh, outcome for a 20-year-old may not be a, uh, an appropriate decision. So I think it's important to consider the patient who's in front of you, to consider what the uh, treatment goals are for the patient as well. And that's, that's our responsibility as surgeons to have that communication. Yeah, the, it's... In, in the end, you do want a physician who's experienced with, with these kind of injuries uh, to gui guide you and give you the appropriate treatment. Um, it could be a simple fracture, which, uh, for example, like the, um, this uh, patient who had a lateral uh, tibial plateau fracture uh, that was displaced and needed it to be fixed with plate and screws, just like Carlos alluded to before as one of the main options. Um, uh, and this could, could this case could potentially uh, have been seen in the urgent care center and eventually ended up in the office of the, uh, one of us. And uh, we can schedule it and coordinate it at the uh, best uh, time for uh, uh, the patient to take care of this injury. Um, alternatively, it could be uh, something more complicated. Now, a lot of these end up in the emergency room immediately after the injury has happened, and you end up a very complex, uh, multiple fracture lines, severely displaced uh, injury, like uh, this young young man who fell at uh, at work off a, a high ladder. And he was initially treated by another surgeon by uh, applying an external fixator because the swelling was just too severe at that point. And later on, he uh, underwent the surgery with plate and screws. Um, and these were just the, some of the, the two cases of, of a spectrum of different injuries. In the end, whether it's non-operative, external fixator, then ORIF, which is a plate and screws uh, option, 
or you going directly to plating screws, there is uh, an expected recovery and uh, rehab for these. Um, uh, Carlos, maybe you can uh, tell us about kind of the expected simple uh, rehab regimen and protocol that you have your patients go through. Sure. Um, so generally, uh, patients, whether it's operative or non-operative, uh, we have to restrict their weight bearing uh, because putting weight on a joint that you've just fixed, although the screws and the plates are very strong, uh, the weight of the body is just too much uh, to, to put on these small fragments of bone that are that just can't support the body weight when they're fractured. So we need to let these, you know, we put a lot of great effort to make the joint back to normal and make it look anatomic and get the, the knee back to looking like a normal knee. If you walk on it too soon, then it's things can start to displace. And so we would generally keep our patients from weight bearing for the first uh, six to eight weeks. Um, patients will generally be seen uh, within two weeks after the original surgery. At that point, I generally take the operative dressings off. We inspect the wounds. We then transition patients occasionally to either a hinge knee brace or occasionally, I, if I'm very happy with the fixation, I won't use a hinge knee brace. But either way, the goal for the first uh, six to eight weeks after surgery is to get your range of motion back because these high energy injuries, they don't just affect the bone. As I mentioned earlier, they affect the muscles and the cartilage and the ligaments and everything wants to get very tight. So it's very important to have a good physical therapist and have a, a good relationship with your physical therapist to, to get your range of motion back and to be able to get your knee all the way straight and to hopefully get flexion over 130 degrees. So it gives people, you know, something to really focus on for the first six to eight weeks when we've limited their weight bearing. Generally, it's six to eight weeks. Again, depending if the x-rays are advancing as, as they normally do, we're happy to start allowing patients to put approximately half of their weight on it. So we call it partial weight bearing. So patients can start learning how to walk again with crutches or a walker, um, and they start uh, advancing how much weight they can put on the leg. Uh, all that time, they're still working on range of motion, they're working on swelling, they're working on elevation and extremity. And uh, a good physical therapist is really invaluable. And uh, I frequently tell patients that the, the easy part was putting it back together. The hard part is really dedicating themselves to therapy and, and doing what needs to be done to, to, to have the best outcome possible. Um, we do our part, you know, it's at the, at, in the operating room, but uh, the rest of three months is a grind for the patient. It's really, a, you know, you have a great patient who's dedicated, they do great. Uh, and, and that's what we try to uh, enforce. And that's why we try to root our patients on to do what they can. Finally, somewhere in the neighborhood of 10 to 12 weeks, x-rays show a healed fracture. We then allow patients to start putting full weight on it. At that point, they can start trying to learn to walk again, even without uh, the two crutches. They can go to a single crutch. They can go to a cane and then eventually stop using any assistive device whatsoever. And generally at 10 to 12 weeks, the patient also starts to work on strengthening, you know, because people, you know, it takes two or three days to start to atrophy and you know, for every week that you're not using those muscles, it, it, I swear it takes probably a month to get those muscles back. So, you know, it's really important at the 10 to 12 week point to start working on getting their quadriceps muscles strong again, getting their hamstring muscles strong again, uh, their ankle muscles. So, you know, it, 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 it really is, turns out to be, I tell my patients once they have a, a really difficult plateau fracture that they're looking at a minimum of four to six months recovery. And it seems like a lot, but once they once they get to that point, they they're like, "You're right, doc. This is a this is a bad injury, and you know I'm glad you gave me a good therapist, and I'm I'm glad that I listened to you, and that you know it's now six months later, and, and I'm doing great." But it really did did mean sticking to the rehab protocol. And this this sounds a very similar uh, protocol with with my patients. I know um, not everyone necessarily falls within that protocol because I, for example, I know Dave, you often work with uh, some of our sports specialists and and uh, as you alluded joint specialist uh, on some of these more complicated cases and um, uh, maybe, maybe you can tell us a little bit about more of the advantage of having that, that available to you sure the uh, the trauma surgeons we trauma surgeons we, we know our way around fixing broken bones uh, pretty well Sometimes the injuries uh, end up in the, the realm of somebody who does ligament reconstruction in addition to having fractures. In fact, some of the, some of the injuries around the knee are purely ligament injuries, uh, and we incorporate the management of the, uh, another component of our team, the sports medicine specialists who do arthroscopic care. Sometimes these injuries um, entail 
enough of damage to the articular or the joint surface that the outcome of getting arthritis in the knee is pretty much a foregone conclusion. Sometimes the injuries are, are where the cartilage is crushed. We can put together pieces of bone that are broken, but crushed cartilage is a very tough reconstruction. And sometimes we need to incorporate a plan that includes future joint replacement. We have all these management uh, teams in place. We have surgeons who do all this type of care for all the different types of injuries. So having all of that in one shop allows us to coordinate care together. And I think that's really important for the outcome. The yeah. patients like it too. They like to be able to go to a surgeon down the hallway who I tell them they, they've worked on a lot of these complex cases. Uh, definitely in a practice where you have trauma surgeons and high energy trauma injuries, the surgeons who do reconstructive surgery are very well accustomed to managing these complex cases. It's not true in every practice. No, I, I was just going to echo that, Dave, that uh, really highlights the benefits of university orthopedics, where we really are a team uh, with with a lot of specialists and a lot of subspecialties, uh, you know, particularly with uh, the trauma cases. Like Dave mentioned, we do use our sports medicine colleagues quite a bit. And we do use our joint uh, colleagues, uh, that joint replacement colleagues quite a bit. And it's really that teamwork and the camaraderie and the willingness to work together uh, that, that really does maximize uh, outcomes for patients from, uh, from our practice at University Orthopedics Associates. Yeah, I, I completely agree with that. It, it makes me, when I worked with the other surgeons on complex cases and I see what kind of work they do, I, uh, it makes a whole, um, well, it makes a world of a difference it's referring your patients that you took care of and you got them to a certain point and maybe there's a little more to go or, or they have another problem that needs to be addressed. I can very comfortably and reliably send it to someone who I worked with directly instead of maybe not having, uh, only having the word of mouth to go off of or, or just as a, an acquaintance or, uh, and knowing someone's reputation and, uh, and then referring those patients uh, to them. I, I, I mean, I mean, I send my family to people that I I know what kind of work they do and their expertise are uh, are uh, where their expertise are and, and on what level they are. Um, and this applies to tibial plateau fractures and any injuries of the limbs, of the pelvis, everything that we take care of. Sometimes having the humility to say, well, I'm not the best surgeon for this part of the problem or for this this component of your injury, but I've got somebody who is really uh, an expert in that uh, keeps us in our wheelhouse and keeps the uh, patient in, in the best hands. Um, if, if you experience a uh, tibial plateau fracture or any orthopedic injury of the limbs um, in your scene at the emergency or your care center or uh, a hospital, your local community hospital, you, you can always ask for university orthopedics and the, trauma specialist uh, to take care of you, um, if, whether you're in the emergency room and you're deciding on a transfer, uh, we can always be reached for potentially coordinating that transfer. If your injury is not uh, severe enough where you need to be admitted directly to the hospital for the care, you can always find us in the multiple locations um, in New Jersey to help you uh, take and uh, to help take care of your injuries.